Exterior Jaiji training camp afternoon. Arab Mujahideen fighters lay in wait as they watch a column of Soviet tanks and APC move slowly towards their position. A single BM-21 rocket launcher and a few mortars are the heavy weaponry that the Arab Mujahideen have to deal with this armored convoy. Due to their limited weaponry, the Arab Mujahideen have spent the last few days suffering from a massive Soviet bombing campaign that ranged from missiles, artillery, and jet fighters. The Soviets have assumed that no one survived this bombing campaign. But the Arab Mujahideen know that as soon as the Soviets enter the range of their heavy weaponry, only tactics will win, not firepower. Over the radio, the commander of the Arab Mujahideen, Abu Abdullah, declares that no one should fire until he gives the signal. As the sound of mortars and the BM-21 being fired breaks the silence, while rockets and mortars land directly on the convoy. Until sunset, the Arab Mujahideen would bomb the Soviet convoy, and with the drawing due to the darkness, but this small victory was only the start of the Battle of Jeji. As hundreds of Soviet special forces, the Spetsnaz, and normal Soviet troops pour into the region, all with the goals of killing Abu Abdullah and destroying his camp. Jeji is where Abu Abdullah would gain his popularity and his actual name, for the first time at least, would be plastered all over the world, Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden grew up in Saudi Arabia in a time where exiles from the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood were allowed to operate within Saudi borders and were supported by the Saudi monarchy in the Arab Cold War. So no surprise here, but the young Osama bin Laden quickly became politicized with Islamist viewpoints. And when Osama bin Laden reached that age where as an adult you can do your own choices, the Muslim world was going through its own political upheaval. Within 1979, you saw the Iranian Revolution, where the secular western-backed Shah of Iran was overthrown and replaced by the Islamist Islamic Republic of Iran, it's kind of in the name, led by Ayatollah Khomeini. Heck, even within the borders of Saudi Arabia, the Grand Mosque in Mecca would be seized by Sunni extremists, where the holy city became a war zone for two weeks. And finally, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan would usher the Muslim world and this young Osama bin Laden into a new age. Osama bin Laden hit this new age hard. Already by 1979, Osama bin Laden was going to Pakistan to fund Afghan Mujahideen factions in the Afghan Jihad via the Pakistani group Jamati Islami. I said by Osama bin Laden himself. In 1979, I remember that I heard from the media while in Jeddah that Russian forces had entered Afghanistan. So I spent about two weeks preparing myself and collecting some funds from my stepbrothers and brothers. We had a brother and friend who was studying in Karachi, the brother of Abdullah Al Jafri. So my stepbrother Mahris and I came there. We came to Karachi delivering donations at that time was through Jamati Islami. Throughout 1979, to 1984, Osama bin Laden was solely known within the Afghan Jihad scene, if he was known at all, as simply a major donor, no more, no less. Osama appears to have only stayed in Lahore and sometimes Islamabad during this time period for a few hours before leaving Pakistan to go to wherever he was going. And it should be stated that Osama was not handing out small amounts of chump change. This man was handing out and organizing donations that went up into the millions of dollars. Osama bin Laden would later become friends with and kind of a student of Abdullah Yusuf Azam, a Palestinian foreign fighter and very charismatic sheikh for the Afghan Jihad. It would be Abdullah Yusuf Azam in 1984 who finally convinced Osama to venture into Peshawar in the Afghan-Pakistan border regions and later on into Afghanistan itself. And when Osama bin Laden returned from his trip in Afghanistan, he was ready to drown himself in the Afghan Jihad. This late introduction into the Jihad is even summarized by Osama himself. Until April 1984, the fear of physical participation remained before me in various ways and those discouraging me had many reasons. However, their discouragement was in good faith, and they were not accustomed to this atmosphere in the Islamic world. Unfortunately, we continued in this situation, and I'm sorry to say it did so until April 1984, 
when we entered the camps of fighting in jihad in Afghanistan for the first time. This is something that even Abdullah Yusuf Azam talks about. Brother Osama came back from Jaji very moved by the jihad and began to give it all his efforts. It was Ramadan, so he collected approximately 5 to 10 million. I do not remember exactly, and he returned to Sheikh Saif and handed it over to him for the union. I should state disclaimer, the union was a term used for Mujahideen factions, not the Soviet Union. This is also the same time frame where Abdullah Azam was coming up with the idea and later on proposing his idea of creating an Arab dominated group that would help Afghan Mujahideen factions in military training, medical training, and logistical support, along with organizing and supplying foreign fighters who were mostly Arabs, hence the term Afghan Arabs. This group would be called Maktab al kadamat the Service Bureau. And when Osama bin Laden heard of this proposal, he jubilantly supported the idea and funded the creation of this group. And the way that Mac worked, it was that Abdullah Azam helped give the Afghan Arabs a political and emotional connection to the Afghan Mujahideen factions, the Muslim and Arab masses, but especially the Afghan Mujahideen leadership. While people like Osama bin Laden, but mostly Osama bin Laden, help fund and organize the flow of Arab foreign fighters into Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now, Osama bin Laden himself was not a organizer, but he paid people who could organize things, so that's pretty important. By September 1984, the Mech group was found with many founding members. Funny enough, Osama bin Laden is not one of the 10 founding members. But it was not until Osama bin Laden returned to Pakistan in November 1984 that the Mecca group was able to form a official headquarters in a building that Osama bin Laden had to rent out. And while later on Osama became a part of the Mecca group, it's very important to say that Mecca Abdullah Azam dominated and run operation. Osama bin Laden could be seen more as a financier than a ideological or political leader of Mecca. But for Osama bin Laden, the call for armed jihad was stronger than the luxuries of Saudi Arabia or the stability within the Pakistan-Afghan border regions. Osama bin Laden began to view Afghanistan from a military and combat mindset. As the mythos of the fearless Afghan Arab and Arab Mujahideen who took down Soviets before being given the mercy of martyrdom was spread across the Arab and Muslim world, the realities of being an Afghan Arab was one of guard duty, medical and manual labor, and possible combat roles. And while you did have cases of organized, mostly ex-Egyptian soldiers fighting in Afghanistan at the same rate as their Afghan allies, the vast majority of Afghan Arabs were not cut from that cloth. It's safe to say a good amount of the Afghan Arabs were either a political dissidents, who could be summarized as bookworms, or they were very young, idealistic, and at times bored Gulf Arabs. But for the actual dedicated and organized and willing to fight Afghan Arabs, this desire for combat and just the reality of organizing people would lead to a split within the Afghan Arab community. The militarists, as I'm going to call them, saw the current Mech and Abdullah Azam viewpoint of being a supporting role in the Afghan Jihad as ineffective. The militarists believed that the Afghan Arabs should be taking more combat roles and that this current situation was unacceptable. The lack of training by Afghan Arabs were at best seen as a nuisance and at worst was seen as getting Afghan Arabs killed due to a lack of training but also a distrust from their Afghan allies. The relationship between the Afghan Arabs and the Afghan Mujahideen factions varied from group to group, unit to unit. But it wouldn't be far-fetched to say that many Afghan Mujahideen factions did not view the Afghan Arabs as an effective fighting force. This was due to a lack of training that the Afghan Arabs had. You also had cases of Afghan Arabs refusing to follow Afghan commands or traditional norms, causing conflict there. Many Afghan Arabs at times were just college or high school students who would only show up during the summer break and then leave in the middle of combat tours or duties or whatever you want to call it. And that's pretty annoying to the Afghan leadership. Another interesting aspect that should be taken into consideration was that the Afghan Mujahideen leadership saw these Afghan Arabs as morale pieces and propaganda icons and at times would refuse to send these Afghan Arabs into battle. This is even summarized by Osama bin Laden when he was asked by Abdullah Azam why he would form his own combat-oriented training camp. To which Osama bin Laden responded, for lack of better words, PC way without angering his Afghan allies, 
I noticed the Afghans' concern and joy at the Arabs among them. Seeing the Arabs was a mean of increasing the Afghans in strength and belief, and it would raise their morale to a high degree. Due to the strong love of the Afghans for the Arabs, they would treat them as guests in that they would not impose any military or combat duties upon them. However, the Arab men wanted to be Mujahideen, and to do the work of the Mujahideen, they did not come to Afghanistan as guests. Due to this, I came up with the idea of forming a place where the Arab brothers can be received and trained to fight. As Osama bin Laden became more interested in Afghanistan, his relationship with Abdullah Azam would begin to deteriorate between the lines of the militarists and non-militarists. And when I talk about the relationship between Abdullah Azam and Osama bin Laden, I mean the relationship along the lines of political and financial. From all accounts, it seems like their personal relationship was a very strong one even after this split. Things would only boil over between the militarists and non-militarists at the failure at the Battle of Zahwar, where many Afghan Arabs were killed. To the militarists, the Battle of Zahwar was everything wrong with the Mek and Abdullah Azam viewpoint. So the militarists began to act independently from Mek and Abdullah Azam. Osama bin Laden and Mamdoud Mahmoud Salim, also known as Abu Hajr al-Iraqi, formed the Sada training camp. This camp was made as an attempt to shift away from Maktab al-Kadamat in the Abdullah Azam dominated viewpoints within Peshawar, but the camp quickly fell into the influence and later on control of Abdullah Azam in Mek, defeating the whole purpose of the camp. So once again, Osama bin Laden formed another training camp with the goals of organizing the militarist Afghan Arabs once more. Osama then created the Masada al-Ansar, the Lion Dens of Helper training camp in Afghanistan itself. By creating this camp in Afghanistan and not Pakistan, the Masada training camp, also known as these things, did not have the legal cover of being in Pakistan but in the combat zones of Afghanistan meaning that the Soviets could attack this camp whenever they wanted to and with as much intensity as they could unleash. Also, creating this camp in the Afghanistan-Pakistan border region was a huge risk. The whole border, but especially the Jaji region, was a place where Soviet troops hunted down Mujahideen supply convoys and caravans. Plus, the Soviets maintained fire superiority over any Mujahideen faction and the nature of guerrilla warfare calls for the avoidance of direct combat with a stronger military force. Heck, I mean the first location of the Masada camp that was scouted out by Osama bin Laden was in clear sight of a Soviet base, so the Soviets would constantly shell the position where Osama bin Laden and his men were, so Osama would have to move the camp location. The construction of the camp is a story within itself. The number of people that helped in the creation and guarding the Jaji camp would fluctuate from 100 men at the start and at summer to about 50 men and within the winter it would boil down to 15 men. And whenever winter would show its ugly face, the Masada camp would have to stockpile on goods because in winter time the camp was damn near snowed in and on its own. I'm going to always stress this but this camp was a sore thumb towards the Soviets. The Soviets knew a camp existed, so there goes the element of surprise that is very important in guerrilla warfare. The camp was also placed in a very mountainous region that made it hard to supply the Mujahideen, let alone the camp. To other Afghan Mujahideen leaders, and even Afghan Arabs, the Jaji camp was a terrible camp that fulfilled no combat role. Everyone doubted Osama bin Laden, and when I say everyone, I mean everyone doubted Osama bin Laden. Seasoned Afghan Arabs who trained in past militaries or had fought in multiple conflicts before Afghanistan looked at the Masada training camp with disgust and a lot of angst. Heck, a council of Afghan Arab leaders would vote against the Masada camp, deeming it a miscalculation, with the council even sending delegates to investigate the camp. And one of the delegates, Abdul Aziz Ali, whose kunya was Abu Osama al masri had to say this about the camp. I saw that it was very easy to attack the place and eradicate it. So I told him, my brother, this is advice from God the Almighty. This place is only suitable for fighters with a high level of experience. Even then, this site is dangerous and it is likely that they will pay dearly. If you must stay, leave only two or three men and not 200. I could not understand how millions of dollars or rupees could be thrown in there. It looked as if someone was throwing money into dust. 
one of Osama's future close confidants and future Al Qaeda commander, Ali Amin Ali al Rashid, more famously known as Abu Ubaidah al Panshiri, said that he only went to Masada to, and I'm quoting him now, did not want to let Abu Abdullah down and felt pity towards his brothers. I felt that most people left them at that time. Even Osama's mentor, Abdullah Azam, viewed this camp with a level of concern, with Azam saying, we were not happy about the gathering of the Arab youth there and we considered it a great risk as the place needed a whole battalion to protect it. Funny enough, with all this controversy, the only group that would publicly support Osama and show him like emotional support and all that stuff was Abdullah Azam's group, Mech, the same group Osama was trying to distance himself from. Abdullah Azam of course viewed this camp with a lot of angst for lack of better words. But he did not want Osama bin Laden to feel isolated from the Afghan Arab community. As said by Abdullah Azam himself, I found Abu Abdullah working in the snow in an isolated area with a group of young men whose number was no more than 10 bars. I was afraid that a helicopter would descend down on them and arrest them, bars again, and take them to Kabul. So I told the brothers who were gathered with me in Sada, it is neither Islamic by God nor manly to leave this brother alone, so let us go to him. And all of the controversy meant nothing to Osama. It was his den. Heck, it was his money. Osama could fund other Afghan Arab endeavors and his own. So who could really stop him? This is even summarized by Afghan Arab and co-founder of Mech, Bujima Bunuau, also known as Abdullah Anas. Once Osama got something into his head, it was very hard to dissuade him. Nevertheless, whenever I pass Jeji, I would see his company bulldozer constructing roads and him walking around speaking to his workers, driving his digger and looking at maps. It was refreshing to see this tall wealthy Saudi working with such energy and zeal for the Afghan Jihad. At the same time, I don't think Osama was thinking about establishing his own organization just yet. The Jeji camp was not an elaborate camp, far from it. The fighters that went to Masada to conduct jihad found themselves conducting construction work instead. One of the de facto leaders of Mech and close confidant to Abdullah Azam, Tamim al Adnani, would constantly get into arguments with Osama bin Laden and Abu Hajr al Iraqi over wanting to conduct military operations. I will always state this fact because, considering what Al Qaeda groups do to Shiites in the future, it's very interesting to see what these groups do at their start, but Afghan Mujahideen Shi'i fighters helped in the creation of Masada, physically and also scouting out territory for Osama. Even with Osama creating an environment for the militarists, he still had to train these guys and plan to conduct the military operation in March. This would all go out the window when Osama bin Laden caught his own men red-handedly trying to attack Soviet and DRA positions without his orders. So Osama practically threw his hands up defeated and said fine. So on April 17th, Osama bin Laden allowed his men to attack a local outpost called Umm al-Kandak, the mother of trenches. On the 17th of April 1987, also known as the 17th of Shaban 1407, among the Afghan Arabs, word began to spread of an impending Arab Mujahideen operation against a DRA position called Umm al-Kandak was being led by Osama bin Laden from the Masada camp. And the big names of the Afghan Arab community were showing up to fight. Abdullah Azam, Osama bin Laden, Abu Ubaid al panshiri and Tamim al Nani to name a few were appearing. Even Afghan Mujahideen leaders like Abdul Rab Rasul al Saif would watch this battle. Now the plan was to attack this outpost under the cover of darkness and take over the base with overwhelming firepower and men. But as the Arab Mujahideen began to crawl into position, they met heavy resistance from a single DRA soldier who would alert the whole camp by pinning down the whole Arab Mujahideen advance with his single machine gun. For a few hours, the Arab Mujahideen advance was halted by at first a single DRA soldier and later on mortar strikes where then Osama bin Laden would give the order to retreat due to the fear of heavy casualties. This mortar strike would kill a single Arab Mujahideen. Ahmed al-Zahrani from Taif, Saudi Arabia would be the first man to die under Osama bin Laden's command. The attack on Umm al-Kandak was an attack, that was about it. It lasted a single evening and did not achieve much tactically, but 
From that operation on, the Patkia province became a battleground between the Arabs and the communist forces, where the Arab Mujahideen would slowly improve their skills but still had multiple failures and hiccups in between. At times, commanders would have their clocks on different times, causing ambushes to fail. Commanders were also using different codes that would cause confusion, but the Arab Mujahideen persisted and the Soviets only got more and more frustrated by the situation, as the mere existence of rebels is a victory for rebels in guerrilla warfare. But the Soviet response a month later is what gained the attention of the world. From the 20th of May 1987 to the 20th of May 1987, Soviet troops, tanks, APC, artillery, airborne reinforcements, and whatever you could think of were being moved into position to attack the Masada camp. And on the 27th of Ramadan, 1407, also known as June 1st, 1987, Soviet forces would shell, napalm, and rocket the Arab Mujahideen positions in the Masada camp, kicking off the Battle of Jeji. It's very important to state that the Battle of Jeji would last about three weeks, so I'm only going to give you spark notes about the battle and even then, it's not in chronological order. Now the opening scene of the video you saw was the first, I guess we could call a gun battle of Jeji. This happened on the 2nd of June. Throughout the entire battle, from the start to end, the Masada camp was constantly shelled. Almost every hour of the day, Soviets were bombing the camp or the Soviets were slowly approaching the Arab Mujahideen positions. The Soviets had feared and assumed that they were going to fight hundreds of fanatical and well-trained Arab Mujahideen, when in reality, they were fighting about 70 to, at the most, and we're pushing it here, 200 Mujahideen if we're including the reinforcements later on. The battle tends to be one where the Arab Mujahideen fighters will hide in their caves and in their trenches and within the Al Masada camp avoiding the Soviet artillery, missile, rocket strikes, and so on and so forth, only for Soviet troops to then get ambushed by the Arab Mujahideen when the Arab Mujahideen would come out of their positions. It is very interesting to state that the Soviets would use a creeping barrage tactic, and the first time this happened, it surprised the Arab Mujahideen a lot. You also have cases of Osama personally ambushing Spetnaz forces, and you have at least two cases of Osama bin Laden almost dying. One is where a rocket would fly right over Osama's head while he was giving orders to his men. That one's kind of boring compared to the other one, where Osama was ambushed by Spetnaz forces that were so close to him that he could hear their footsteps and their equipment, but he couldn't see the Spetnaz forces due to how well camouflaged they were. Sharing foxholes with fellow Mujahideen, Osama only continued to build his reputation. While commanders of the battle like Abu Ubaidah al-Banshiri and Muhammad Atif, also known as Abu Hafs al-Masri, gained confidence in Osama's leadership skill. And the other Afghan Arabs didn't sit by. Afghan Arab Mujahideen reinforcements would include Abdullah Azam and Tamim al -Adnani along with Afghan reinforcements. We can't forget that at most the Arab Mujahideen were barely breaking 150 and if you want to push it, 200 men against hundreds of Soviet special forces. At one point within the battle, the odds began to shift towards the Soviets and their number and weaponry superiority. Osama bin Laden would call for reinforcements, but funny enough, a dispute would happen between the Afghan and Arab Mujahideen. Afghan Mujahideen leader Abdul Rab Basul Al Saif wanted the Arab Mujahideen to withdraw from the camp and to let the Afghan finish the battle. But the Arabs then got into an argument with their Afghan allies over leadership of the battlefield. Interestingly enough, if Osama failed at this battle, his whole reputation could have been destroyed right then and there. But it wasn't. The Soviets didn't know about this, and the Soviets slowed down their assault. This would give the Arab Mujahideen breathing room to reorganize themselves. The Soviets played a bad hand, but both Arab and Afghan reinforcements would arrive before the Soviets could reorganize and push on. Now the final act of the battle involving the Arab Mujahideen is pretty dramatic. At this very moment, the main Soviet assault force consisting of Spetnaz forces were only a few hundred meters from the camp, while the defenders of the Masada camp barely broke about 20 guys. Due to the number superiority the Soviets had, Osama and Abu Ubaidah would come up with a new plan. Osama's group, which consisted of about four to five guys, 
would stay at the Masada camp and they would hold off any Soviet advancing forces. These guys would be used as a stalling unit, while Abu Ubaidah's group that consisted of 9 men would lead a flanking maneuver on the main Soviet assault force. And it seems like a pretty simple plan, and at first it was working pretty well Osama's group was holding off this Soviet advance, but Abu Ubaidah's group never showed up. Osama would even call into his radio with no response multiple times. Later on, Soviet artillery would land on the Masada camp trying to target bin Laden's group, and Osama and his men would have to flee into a nearby cave. At this very moment, the fear of the Soviets overwhelming the group of five men was compounded. Maybe this was a creeping barrage tactic. And then at that very moment, Osama bin Laden's radio came to life. It was Abu Ubaidah calling out to Osama. Abdul Kaka, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. I should state that Osama was using different kunyas because the Soviets were listening into their radio comms and vice versa. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, I convey good news, we have killed the Russian commandos, their bodies are strewn on the ground under our feet as I speak, Allahu Akbar. While Osama and his group were holding off the Soviets and later on hiding in the cave from artillery, Abu Ubaid's group of 9 men flanked the main Soviet assault force where the Arab Mujahideen were able to cut down and kill multiple Spetnaz troops. After this final flanking attack, the Soviets would halt their assault on the Masada camp, coming to the conclusion that the casualties were too high. The Arab Mujahideen fought during Ramadan and throughout Eid, while the Soviets withdrew. In the coming weeks, the story of Jeji and Osama bin Laden would spread across the Arab and Muslim world like a wildfire. But before the popularity, in the ashes of the camp, Abu Ubaidah al-Panshiri would hand Osama bin Laden an AK-47U as a gift. This was a luxury item for Mujahideen fighters. It was a symbol of pride as only Soviet special forces and pilots used these rifles and capturing one was a sign of a hardened veteran and a effective commander. At first a harsh skeptic of al-Masada and one could say Osama's leadership, Abu Ubaidah al-Panshiri had complete loyalty to the man now. Osama reflected on the fighting saying, With the grace of God, I led the lion's den of Al-Ansar against the Russians. This was at a time when my group was split and all my colleagues stood against me in Peshawar until Abu Ubaidah arrived from the north and helped me. May God have mercy upon him. Later on, Abdul Rab Rasul al-Saif would take charge of the Jaji camp with his own Afghan fighters and continue the fight. But at this moment, there was one for the Arab Mujahideen in Osama's confidence.